Welcome back, everyone. I got a real treat. I got Renee Patton, the founder of Blue Glass. She's been in the business game for over 26 years, starting with a background in education, working at Cisco, then doing something else with a company we'll talk about later. I think it was called like Human Q. And essentially, she focuses on developing people and the culture, and that will then lead to the results people are seeking. So happy to have Renee on to share her journey and share her insights on how she took an education degree and turned that into a superpower in the business world. So happy to have Renee on. So like you go to school for education. Was the goal to be a teacher? Was it not like how, how does that happen? Mm -hmm. Hey, Josh, it's great to be here today. Thank you for having me. I was really looking forward to this. Um, yeah, it's, it's such a good question. I never planned on being a teacher, never planned on going into education um, what was kind of funny is I grew up in the Bay Area and I always thought I was going to go into business. Um, I grew up in a family business and that was just sort of something that I thought I would do. I would follow in the footsteps of my family. Um, and I ended up going to Santa Clara University here in the Bay Area and um, was a business major and absolutely didn't like it at all. Uh, so I, I remember um, at Santa Clara, you used to have to take engineering or calculus for engineers at the time. So they didn't have calculus for business majors. And I remember having to take calculus and statistics and um, in high school, didn't really have a strong math background. So um, I started realizing that was not a good connection for me. Um, so I would, you know, wander through the mission gardens at Santa Clara and I would see all these people sitting under palm trees, reading books. And I um, started asking them what their majors were. And they said, oh, we're English majors. And I said, well, that's great. I want to sit under palm trees and read books. So that's what I did. I shifted from business and I got um, my undergraduate degree in uh, English and always loved French. And so I got my minor in French and I, I really didn't know what I'd do with it. And I think um, the first sort of lesson learned for me at a very young age was to follow um, your passion areas. So follow the things you absolutely love to do. And those were always the two subjects that I loved and that I was good at. So I haven't quite ans answered your question, but that was even before the education thing. So like you switched over from business to education. What did you learn being in, edu in education studying that gave you like that advantage going into the business world? Because your goal was to go into business, not teaching, right? Well, my goal, my goal originally was to go into business until I realized how much I didn't like it. Uh, <laughs> so then I got the, the thing, this English degree and French degree, and I thought, okay, well, I'll just find, I'll figure it out. And then from there, I got my master's degree in education from Stanford and realized that I loved it. And so, um, you know, kind of was a high school teacher, ran for the school board, was on the local um, board of trustees for a number of years. And then, um, literally had to find a job where I was going to make more money because I had two uh, young children and I was going through a divorce when they were one and three. And so I realized that I needed to find something where I was going to have uh, more earning potential. And so a friend of a friend referred me into Siemens as a, um, a marketing, a services marketing program manager. And I had no idea what services really were at the time. Um, marketing, I kind of knew because I was a, I used to be a business major. Um, and I didn't really know what program managers did. And so interestingly, and I think to answer your question, I was hired by a former history teacher. And so I asked him, I said, well, why would you hire a teacher um, for this job? And he said, well, as a teacher, you have all the requisite skills and knowledge or skills and experience. He didn't say knowledge, but he said, you have a lot of experience in setting milestones so you can set goals and objectives, doing lesson plans so you can put together a program and that he explained kind of what programs are. He said, you manage the classroom so you can probably manage people. Um, you're probably a pretty good communicator. So he literally ticked through the list of skill sets in education and said, this is how you can transfer it to business. So I think my first big lesson learned was, wow, if people have <clears throat> mentors and guides and coaches who can help them to understand those transferable skills or help them to navigate the business world, their chances of, of success will increase exponentially. And so he kind of brought me in, took me under his wing and um, taught me how to do services marketing and taught me how to be a program manager. And then I realized I loved business because I could see the impact that you could have coming from a completely different background. So what you're saying is for any teachers that are out there who are like, 
we don't get paid enough. They have the skills to go be successful somewhere else because you have to know how to control an audience. And when you're dealing with children, that could be, that's a superpower in itself, being Mm -hmm. able to get kids to calm down and pay attention for the duration of a class and being able to be organized and deal with the, the chaos Mm -hmm. of being a teacher and in education. So do you have any idea of like what's stopping these educators from doing that? Do they just not know or not believe that they could get a job doing something else if they're unhappy with like their current economic situation? Well, and I think it's an even bigger question and a bigger audience than teachers. Um, so I think it's really anybody in any profession. I always recommend to my my clients um, a series of top 10 lists. So the first thing that I ask them to do is to write down the top 10 things that they uh, love to do. So what are the top 10 things that they really love when they think about personally, professionally, um, what do they really like to do? The next top 10 list is what are the top 10 things that they're really good at doing? And these are their superpowers. And so literally they have to be able to say, these are all the things I'm great at doing. And then they look at those two lists and say, okay, what do I like? And what am I good at doing? Because it's not really going to do them any good if they're good at it, but they don't really like doing it. So they end up with this list of skill sets and interest areas that help them um, to make a decision about other industries where they could use those skill sets to be successful and effective. The third top 10 list that I ask them to do is the top 10 things they would never want to do in a million years, because that helps them too, because they can say, oh, I never want to have a job where I have to manage people. So I might be really good at it because I was in a classroom setting and I knew how to do classroom management, but I never want to manage people. So that's the third top 10 list. The fourth top 10 list is what are my blind blind spots? Um, What are areas where I need to improve? Do I have any skills that I need to add in terms of what I think I might want to do? And so with these top 10 lists, they can say, yep, you know, I've had this kind of a background, either maybe I've been in education, uh, maybe I've been an attorney. Uh, maybe I've been a consultant, whatever the case may be, and they figure out, okay, based on what I can do and what I like to do, what are the things I might like to do? So I think it's really nice to be able to say, instead of, hey, I'm a teacher, I can only be a teacher. It's more important to say, what are the skill sets that I've acquired as a teacher? And maybe they're science teachers. So I might say, what are your superpowers as a scientist? And they might say, well, I'm really great at developing hypotheses. I'm really good at analyzing data. And so kind of pulling those skill sets out of what they're doing and then being able to apply it forward. That's exactly what happened to me. I went to school for math and I was supposed to go into the actuarial field and I ended up in finance. Mm -hmm. And then I realized no one knew what I knew and Mm -hmm. realized there was lots of problems in the financial industry. And by having a math background, it gave me where what I felt like is in an unfair advantage compared to the other people because they don't look at things the same way that I see things. And Mm -hmm. being able to see things from a different lens is huge. And it seems like that's exactly what you were able to do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and and I love your example. I mean, your example of math, I think people with math backgrounds, people with English backgrounds, science backgrounds, before it doesn't really matter what you studied. Um, the fact of the matter is, is that there are, you know, mad skills that you've been able to acquire as a result of those areas of study. And you just see the world differently. I always say I attribute my English background to my success um, because it helped me to learn how to argue persuasively. It helped me to build a five paragraph essay. It helped me to think critically and analytically. Um, and I can structure conversations. It helped me to do presentations. So all those things that, and a lot of times we think, oh gosh, my sociology degree wasn't that important. Or, you know, in high school, I had a huge interest in math and I was really good at this. Um, or, you know, I was interested in the trades. I did, you know, voc ed and those, all of those skills matter and they all shape your world at a very young age and help to have an impact on what you ultimately decide to do. So you were motivated to carve out a better life for you and your children going through a loss of a relationship. So I'm sure that was, you needed no motivation. You were, you were going to run through the wall, not to the wall in order to make this happen. What, what is someone that feels like they're stuck? 
needs to do other than like looking at their top 10 list? How does someone who feels like that they're stuck at their current job and there's no hope, how do you help people see that there is light for them to make a transition to get a new chapter and to put their past behind them? It's such a great, I, it's such a great question, Josh. I love that question. Um, it's striking how many people I work with who don't know what their vision is for their life. They don't know what their purpose is. And they haven't answered the question, who am I? And so I do a lot of work with people just around helping them to figure out what it is they think they'd like to do. And 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 people say, well, I don't want to have a defined path. You don't have to have a defined you know, path. But where is it that you'd like to be in the next one, three, five, 10, 25 years? Where do you think you want to be? Can you imagine yourself? running your own company and being responsible for, you know, 500, a thousand or more employees. Do you want to manage people? Can you imagine yourself in a completely different career? Um, so I try to get them to think forward. Um, think about what's their purpose in life. Some people are super values driven and they're in jobs that have nothing to do with what their values are. And that may be really difficult for them. Other people say, yeah, I'm not living out my best values. I'm not living out my mission and my job, but I'm doing the side thing. I'm doing volunteer work. I'm doing this that, that enables me to live my values and my best life. So I think that's number one is to figure out what are your aspirations? What do you think you want to do? That can be challenging because that could come with having to take a step back in terms of compensation. And people are like, well, I always want to be moved forward with compensation. I don't want to move backwards. Mm -hmm. What would you say to someone like, well, you know, I'm making $200,000 a year. I don't like my job, but the money's good. And if I did what you're, you know, my passion, I'm only going to make $75,000 a year. So someone that's taken your path mm -hmm. from going from education to upwards, how would you get someone to shift their mindset in that capacity to see the big picture, not just the, you know, one to three year sacrifice that might come with something. Mm -hmm. So then I would ask what's more important to you, money or owning a flower shop down in the corner. So we you know what, so truly what's the most important thing to you. And it forces them to think through, you know, what's most important because quite frankly, money might be really important to a lot of people. I mean, it is important to them. Right. And they, they may not be willing to make that sacrifice and say, I'm going to give up my $200,000 job. But what they might decide to do is to say, hey, I'm going to make this $200,000 job more manageable. I'm going to make sure that I'm clearly defining priorities. I'm only going to work 40 or 50 hours a week. I'm going to do everything I can to make sure that this job is not all consuming. <clears throat> and then for the other parts of my life, if I have a passion in, for me, it was executive coaching. It was, co I love coaching. I loved helping people developing their careers. So I stayed at the big job. And while I was at the big job, I acquired the skill sets that I would need to ultimately become an executive coach. So I got my certification when I was still working um, full time. Um, I started taking on pro bono clients. I started coaching clients from within the organization. So I was able to intersect the big job with, huh, ultimately I want to do this. Mm -hmm. Too many people, I feel like, look at something as like, how do I make money from this? Mm hmm. And when you're starting something new, you have to figure out first, who am I able to help and mm -hmm. what value could I provide to help them? And then what is that value worth to someone? Mm -hmm. So like by figuring out like, hey, I've seen five people ask me for the same help. That tells you that there's a problem. Mm -hmm. Then the tough part could be is like, how do you value something that you love doing? Exactly. And, and what makes you unique in your doing it? So why, there are, you know, millions of executive coaches out there, right? Um, so what makes, what makes your offering or your, what you're doing uh, different? How do you differentiate yourself? It's just like marketing, right? How do you differentiate yourself in the market? Um, the other thing that's interesting, Josh, is uh, people who are making a lot of money, right? They don't want to give that up. And I, I completely, I, I completely understand that. Um, sometimes there's just like this big number out there. Like I want to get to this number. Once I get, you know, this much money, I'm going to be happy. And so I always ask people to say, um, how much do you have? 
And how much do you need? And then how much do you want? Because it really forces them to say, here's my kitty. This is what I have today. Um, this is what I need to live my life. And then this is what I ultimately want. Because they might end up having a lot more than they think they have. But because they're focused on this, you know, some amorphous goal out here, uh, they think they need more. Mm -hmm. I like to ask people like, hey, Renee, if I gave you $10 million, what would you do with it? Yeah. They're like, oh, I'd play pickleball or go to the gym and just put it in the bank account and live off the interest. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And what are you going to do with the interest? I mean, what are you going to travel? Are you... <laughs> well, the thing is, rather than looking at money, what where I see a lot of people struggling is creating assets. You have to create an asset that's going to grow with you mm -hmm. over time. Because mm -hmm. if I give someone, I mean, you see it all the time, people that win the lottery within a generation or two, the money's gone because mm -hmm. they don't know what to do with it. They don't know where to put it. They don't know how to invest it. They mm -hmm. don't know how to manage the money, especially when you grow up not having a lot of money. All of a sudden you have it. You feel like, oh, you know, $10 million. There's no way I could blow through $10 million. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But when you look at it, $10 million over the course of someone's lifetime or a couple generations, it's not that much. And if you don't do the right things with it, that $10 million is going to dwindle down to thousands of dollars just just based off inflation. So is that something that you help people see is like, how do you create some sort of asset? Is that kind of like on the right track of what you're talking about? Well, I would send them to you for that. <laughs> 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 um but i mean like an asset in terms of like hey um you're working at you were working at cisco during this time i'm going to start creating this little asset on the side here mm -hmm, so yes. that way it's like hey i'm using my time at cisco to fund this which could turn into an asset so that it gives me the choice of i could stay here and do this or i could give up this and go full full time on what i love doing all day Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I think we're defining assets in two different ways. So the way you're mm -hmm. defining asset in that context, I think that's right because you got to be able to do a great job for wherever you're working. Right. So, um, I mean, I spent 17 years at Cisco and I mean, my, my, I, I think I bled blue, you know, I mean, we, I was very dedicated to Cisco. Cisco helped me to build the life that I, that I have today. Um, so I think it, it's important to make sure that you're, if you're a full-time employee, you're dedicated and invested in that company. But my point really was that while you're there, do the soul searching, don't wait to get laid off <laughs> or don't wait to quit. Don't wait to say, gosh, I'm so frustrated. I'm so burnt out. I'm going to quit. Do the soul searching of what it is you think you might like to do in the future and what brings you joy and happiness. So that's where the top 10 lists really come into play because it forces people to think about what's going to make you happy. If you get out and you've got this $10 million nest egg, um, I mean, are you going to buy another purse? Are you going to go buy another sports car? Are you, you know, so what feeds your happiness beyond, uh, beyond money? And so I think that's really the key because then you can say, oh, I'm so passionate about helping the community or being engaged or doing coaching or whatever the case may be. And then you can start doing some of that on the side on the weekends and the evenings um, and even helping people at work, for example, um, so that you can uh, potentially have that in your definition as an asset at some point when you decide to leave that gig. Right. And at what point did you know, like, Hey, I can, I could leave this behind. Oh, such a good question. I've been out of corporate for uh, two and a half years now. Mm. And so really looking, we did, I did exactly the same thing with mm. my husband, my husband, um, I remarried and have been married, married now for uh, over 25 years. Um, but we kind of did the same thing. We both said, hey, this is how much we have. This is how much we think we need to live. And then these are some things that we can do to augment our salary. And that's what we did. Um, and so that that was when I said, okay, um, enough is enough. I'd been, um, I spent the last two years at Cisco right in the heart of COVID, um, covering two of the largest verticals of the company, education and healthcare. And so after being in front of a screen 
you know, 12 to 14 to endless hours per day and working every weekend, I think eventually you get to a point where you have an opening. It was like your example in the beginning when you said, gosh, I'm stuck in this job. There are so many people who are stuck in their jobs and how do they get gain the motivation to do it? I think it's at a certain point, you just sort of know when you don't want to do it anymore. I can't give you a magic bullet, but you sort of, I woke up one day and said, gosh, my my hips hurt, my neck hurts, my back hurts. I'm, I'm not feeling well. And I think that's a lot of, that's a lot of what happens. So. I only lasted in corporate America about, I'll give it four years. There you go. (laughs) After, after that, I was just like, there's nothing more for me to do here. There's, I'm not learning anything. Mm -hmm. I've maxed out my compensation. And I Mm -hmm. looked at the mirror. I was like, do I really want to be maxed out at 26 years old like Mm -hmm. this can't be it Mm -hmm. I gave up Mm -hmm. like my last bonus to like leave and join another company because I see people they're like one more bonus one more bonus and then it's like just one more bonus I mean I gave up I mean my bonus was going to be probably more than like twenty thousand dollars I gave that up to like get out I was like listen I just got to get out because it's only it's only twenty thousand dollars I know that's like a good chunk of change for a lot of people and that could change a lot of people's lives but you also have to have a mindset shift that your time is gone as soon as mm-hmm. it's here. Like right now, we are on a podcast. Right now, you and me on the Unconventional Money Moves podcast, this is the most important thing right now is focusing on this podcast. And a lot of people got to realize, like before you know it, if you enjoy doing something and you're tired of watching the good days go by, eventually you have to make a choice and you have to choose what's going to, allow you to be your best self. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So, so well said. I wish I'd known that at 26, but. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's been a lot of sacrifice. I mean, you have to give up the yep. things that aren't really that important, mm-hmm. um, but they seem important at the time. Yeah, absolutely. Well, and I think the, the thing that really dawned on me uh, was just the stress level. And, you know, every, we, we all work, you got to work hard, right? I mean, but you work hard and you do all, you do this for your whole entire life. And if, if you're not doing something that brings you joy while you're doing it, and by the way, I loved my jobs, you know, I loved working in business. So it wasn't that I felt like I just had my nose to the grindstone and I, I hated it the whole time. You know, I, I will tell you, I loved everything I was doing. And my dad, who's 95 now, he always said, he always likes to say, I never worked a day in my life because I love my job so much. And so that all is great. I mean, I can truly say it was a wonderful experience, but sitting is the new smoking. And I think we spent so much of our days sitting behind desks, um, experiencing an inordinate amount of stress, maybe not always eating well, not sleeping well because of the stress, drinking too much. You know, I love coffee, but drinking too much of it, right? Uh, Not doing the right things, not exercising enough. And that all catches up with you. And all of a sudden, you know, you hear these stories about people who retire and they don't last that much longer because they put their bodies under so much stress. So that was another, that was another big reason for me to say, okay, enough is enough. Mm -hmm. So when you left Cisco, you joined another company, Human Q. What, what happened there? Well, actually I started my own company. So I started um, Blue Glass Company. And so it was, I was doing consulting and coaching. So I said, oh, this is the perfect, this is what differentiates me is I can coach from within the trenches. So I can do the consulting and I can do the executive coaching and I can do communications and leadership coaching. So I tried to really find what my superpowers were and I built those into a business. So I did that first. And then I, what I did was I went out and I found organizations where I could partner with them. um, And they were, they, they already were acquiring coaching clients. So Skillsoft, HumanQ is one of those. And one of the things I love about HumanQ is that it's, they do group coaching. So um, they do one-on-one coaching as well, but they coach within groups of six. And it's incredibly powerful for people to you know bounce ideas off of one another. And they really coach one another in those group coaching sessions. So that's been a lot of fun working with them. Were they your first client? Uh, no, I had a bunch of direct clients. Um, and then, um, Skillsoft was actually my first client. So Skillsoft, <laughs> is, have you heard of Skillsoft? They're the fourth largest training company in the, in the world. I can't say I have. 
Yeah. Yeah. So they're a big company. And how, how did you find that gig? Um, so as with my entire career, I've had amazing mentors. And so in this, I would never have, I mean, I knew I liked coaching and I, I knew I loved leading and managing people. I wouldn't have used the term coach, honestly, Josh, 10 years ago. I don't even think I knew that there was such a thing as a, as a business coach or an executive coach. Um, but one of my great friends who was a colleague, uh, she ended up being one of my clients in my previous consulting company that I uh, started years ago. Um, she left corporate to be an executive coach. So she was going through the whole um, process of trying to find a certification organization, um, trying to get clients, trying to figure out how to build a business. And so she actually um, connected me with that organization. They used to be Pluma. They were a boutique coaching um, company that Skillsoft acquired. Mm -hmm. So you you were introduced to someone at this company through a mentor. Like, how did you how did you approach that? Because a lot of people struggle asking for help. You mean um, how did I approach the company? Yeah, how, like how did you how did you approach whomever you did in order to land land that first first job? Yeah, such a good such a good question. So this is another um, sort of. I don't want to call it a silver bullet, but one of the things that I think is so critically important in terms of how we manage our careers going through life, make sure you maintain your network. Mm -hmm. So you, you can't just go onto LinkedIn and say, oh, so-and-so, I'm connected with so-and-so. Um, didn't really know them that well, but they work at um, they work at Google. So I'm going to ask them to help me at Google. And they're going to say, well, yeah, I accepted your connection request uh, several months or years ago, but I have no idea who you are. I'm going to have a hard time helping you at Cisco when I don't know who you are. And so I think what's really important is that you make sure that you maintain your relationships. So even starting today, think about all the people who you know well and who know you well and who can comment on your work and make it a point to cultivate relationships with those individuals. Um, I think that that networking is is such a an underrated um, skill set. You know, people don't really value it that much, um, but it's really important. So this person who helped me um, and who helped, you know, I mean, we talked all the time. We she gave me advice. I gave her advice. Um, she was one of my. I would say I have. There are probably five people in my career who are my true mentors and supporters. And those five people, we've helped one another um, through thick and thin. So by the time she was helping me think about, gosh, do you want to be an executive coach? She said, go to this company to get your certification. And I, I just said, okay, I'm going to do it. Because mm -hmm. we knew each other that well. And she knew I would be a good fit for it. And I knew it was good for her. Um, so that's kind of how that, that worked, if that makes sense. Did you ever have a time where you felt like uncomfortable possibly like bringing up to someone who didn't have like a business relationship with to possibly like cross over to like, you know, change the dynamic a little bit, such as like you go out with a friend, like how would, how do you approach that? Because, you know, sometimes, you know, you have a friend dynamic in some sort of capacity, you're looking to start something and you're, you know, you want to ask your friends for help. That could be a little awkward sometimes. Yeah, absolutely. Such a great question. So I think it's about casting a broad net knowing it's not going to happen overnight and trying to find connections and affinities. So rather than going to someone and saying, Hey, Josh, I see you have this podcast. I, I really want to, you know, be on it. I want you to help me with developing my own podcast, right? You and I develop a relationship and you say, Oh yeah, I had Renee on my podcast. And now it sounds like she wants to do a podcast for her own company. You might be more willing to do it for me now because you and I are spending time together. We're, you know, we're, we're having a meal together, if you will. Mm -hmm. And developing a, connections and relationships. You're telling me about your background. I'm telling you about mine. Um, so I think you're going to be more likely to help me in the future. But I'm not going to come on here today and say, hey, Josh, can you help me develop my website? Huh. Can you help me create a podcast I want to start on Monday? Yeah, I'm down. I'll show you how to do it. <laughs> See? And that's the other thing that's so, that's so interesting about that dynamic that you and I just did is people are more willing to help you than you think they are. And it's been astounding, you know, even to call somebody instead of saying, hey, can you help me to get a job at XYZ company? 
to contact them and say, hey, I'm, cons I'm looking at a job here. Um, would you be willing to spend 10 minutes with me to talk about the dynamics of the company? Right. So you're not asking them for help to get you the job. You're saying, hey, could you spend 10 or 15 minutes with me? I'd love to learn more. So you're not asking them to do anything. Mm -hmm. And then again, that's relationship building. So you're getting to know that person a little bit better. And then at some point in the future, they can help you more. Does that answer your question? You can't come in high. You can't be like, Renee, you worked at Cisco. Can you get me a job at Cisco? Yes. <laughs> you got to come in and um, be a little softer and mm -hmm. have a good intention behind something because it seems like nowadays people are more skeptical than ever. Mm -hmm. And oh, I'm not yeah. sure why that is. I'm not sure if it's always been like that or it's just compounded because of the society that we live in. It's so much easier to stay in, in connection with people nowadays because of social media. What are your thoughts on that being that you've uh, been in business longer than I have? Oh my gosh. Well, it's really, it's really a good question. So I think we find ourselves in a time where there are a lot of layoffs right now. And so there are a lot more people out looking for work, depending on where you are in the country and what industries you're in, but certainly in tech. And um, people are careful about their referrals into companies. So for example, if somebody say I'm working at Cisco or, you know, Met or what, whatever it is, and somebody approaches me and I don't, I might have 10 people approaching me to have me help them at the company. So regardless of who I put forward, I have to be able to put forward somebody who I think is going to do a good job. Mm -hmm. Right. So I think number one is competition. So I think people might be off put because they're thinking, I don't know why Renee doesn't work. Help me. She's a director or a VP at Meta. Why isn't she helping me? Well, it's because that person might have 10, 15, 20 other people hitting them up for a referral. So I think that's number one. Number two, they may not know you well enough. So that's the whole light touch thing, right? You have to develop more of a relationship for them to help. Um, and number three, they just um, may not have the political capital to help you. Uh, number four, they might have limited contacts and, and they don't want to use up one of their contacts in case they get laid off in the future and they need to be able to go to that person. So there are kind of all these dynamics behind why someone, why you perceive that someone may not want to help you when in fact, you know, there, there may be things that you hadn't considered. And it, it may not be that they don't want to help you at all. They might help you in some other way. That's a great nugget. Don't come in too hot. Ask the right questions. Keep it limited. Ask for like a small ask. And then people, you know, hopefully will open up and allow, allow themselves to help point you in the right direction. So I think that's great and a great stopping point. Now, Blue Glass, who do you help with Blue Glass? Like, are you companies, individuals, both? Just in yeah, case both. anyone that listens to this, they may be like, yeah. I like Renee. Let me reach out to her. Yeah, absolutely. So I do I do um, consulting. So I do a lot of, um, I can do business consulting, marketing consulting. But what I really like doing is helping companies with strategic planning. Um, and it comes all the way back down to that question of what's your vision for the future? Where is it that you'd like to go? And then how do you plan backwards? Um, so I've done a lot of strategic planning and um, strategic consulting. So I do that. Um, but then I really do leadership coaching. I do executive coaching. Um, as I mentioned, group coaching, group facilitation. So when leaders want to bring a team together and they have three days to do it, um, how do they make sure that they optimize their results and they get what they really want to get out of that three-day meeting when they're pulling in people from across the country or the globe? Um, so I do that type of work too. Increasingly, I've been doing a lot of communications coaching. And for almost every single client I have, um, communications is one of their goals in coaching is to become a better communicator, a better storyteller. They really want to be able to tell a good story. So I can help them with that too. Well, folks, you heard it here. Have a vision, ask for help, and never quit. So glad to have Renee on. We'll see everyone next time. Bye, everyone. Thanks, Josh.